Well, we are in week two of our series, What the World Needs Now. And and over the course of this series, we're walking through what is known as the fruit of the Spirit. And maybe that means something to you. Maybe you've never heard that phrase before. What it comes from is it comes from words that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the church in the ancient city of Galatia. And this is what he said in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Paul would say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And uh, what I mentioned last week is that these, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit, it is singular in nature. Matter of fact, A lot of scholars will say all of what we see in this list rolls up into the first, that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, we ask, well, what is love? Well, love is joy, love is peace, love is patience, love is kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these things help us understand the fullest picture of what it means to be people of love. Now, there was something else I said last week that's really important, and I'll probably mention it every week of the series, is that what we talk about, the attributes that we talk about, they're not things that we develop in ourselves. What happens is we cultivate the soil, but when these attributes sort of grow in us, it's the supernatural work of God. And so when we become people who are filled with joy, we don't create joy in life. God creates joy in us. We just ensure that we cultivate again the environment for joy to grow. And so last week, that's what we talked about. We talked about joy. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about peace. And if you missed last week, uh, or if you miss any week, you can always go to our website, lakesawyerchurch.org, and check out the messages you missed, or you can uh, catch up on our YouTube channel as well. Um, When we start talking about peace, though, one of the first things that we have to really wrestle with is what is peace? Like, what is peace? Peace. And when I say that, I'm sure like for a lot of you, you're like, oh, I know what peace is. Like immediately you have an image that that comes to mind that defines what peace is for you. But, But peace is really broad. And my guess is even for a lot of us, we might define peace a little bit differently. So for example, is peace the absence of conflict? And what I mean by the absence of conflict, I mean, is it the absence of relational conflict? Like, are we at peace when there's no conflict at work, when there's no conflict at home, when there's no conflict with our kids, when there's no conflict with our spouse, when there's no conflict at church? Is, is that what peace is, when relationally we are in harmony with other people in our lives? Well, that can be what peace is, and for some of us that's what we think about when we think about peace. Others think, well, well peace is when the world isn't at war, when there's not conflicts of nations fighting against nations, when that happens, then there's peace. And the, the reality is that those conflicts, wars are happening at a far greater rate than most of us are even aware of. Like I, I was sitting here thinking this past week, oh, I can think of a handful of wars, but I thought like how many conflicts are being fought in our world today? And the number was over 27. Like there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of war that is being, is, is being fought. And so, well, is peace then the absence of those things? Or is peace a state of tranquility? Like inner, like when we have inner tranquility, when everything feels at at, at ease within our lives, is that what peace looks like? And again, all of us have these different envisionments, uh, envisionments of what peace is. And even though we probably might not define peace the same way, here's what I'm willing to go on the limb and guess that, uh, that we all hold in common. Each and every one of us, we want peace. Like innate in who we are, what we want more of is we want more peace in life. Like I don't think there would be anyone who's like, man, I feel best when all of my relationships are filled with conflict. Like when everyone's just fighting against me, ooh, I feel so good. And like when there's nations at war, like I love that. And man, when like when my, the inside all part of me is just, the inside is just all like just tore up and, and it's just a constant struggle. I love life at that moment. No one says that. What we want is more peace. Now, what I want us to understand is we begin to shift and talk about what the Bible says about peace is this biblical view of peace sort of encompasses what we talk about in our world. We want, you know, we want relational peace. We want internal peace. We want societal peace. But it also expands on it. Peace is those things. But the Bible offers a view of peace that is so much more than just what we yearn for in our world today. 
And as you read through the pages of Scripture, you'll see that the Bible talks a lot about peace. Matter of fact, over 300 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament combined, there are references towards peace. Now, they use different words. Uh, In the Old Testament, which is originally written in Hebrew, they use the word shalom to define peace. And you maybe have heard that word before. Uh, In the New Testament, which is primarily written in Greek, they use the Greek word irene. And both of these words, again, they are used to describe peace, but it's something more. Peace that we see in Scripture, words that are used to describe it are words like completeness, uh, well-being, reconciliation. This idea that a person is at peace when they are whole, that a person is whole, the person who is whole is a person who has found peace. Which then leads us to the question, well, then how do we get that? Like, how do we become whole people? How do we find peace? How do we get peace? Because if if we want peace, if we want our lives to be peace-filled, and there's something that needs to happen for us to find wholeness in life, where do we go and find that? Now, I think we can all agree it would be hard for us to imagine a world where there is no war. Uh, hard, hard for us to imagine that there'd be a world where there is no relational conflict, uh, a, a world where everyone is, just has internal harmony with themselves. Matter of fact, there have been people who have dedicated their entire lives to that pursuit only for life to come to an end and there not to be much progress towards what they dedicated their lives to. But when you open up the pages of, of, of the Bible, you see this clear picture of where we find our wholeness a clear picture of where we find peace that, go, that encompasses, again, part of what we understand in the world, but builds upon it and calls us to something more. I want us to look at the words that the, uh, the prophet Isaiah wrote in an Old Testament book that he penned with his name. And as I read these words, it's going to remind you a lot of Charlie Brown. All right? Isaiah chapter, six, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 6 Uh, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah says there will be someone who comes, that he will be known for a lot of things, but one of the things he'll be known most for is that he is the Prince of Peace. That Isaiah is foretelling of the one who is going to bring peace to the world, the one who is going to bring wholeness to humanity. Eventually, this person would give up their life for ours. He would be the one who helped reconcile us back to God, to make us whole. And it's not just Isaiah that says this. Matter of fact, Jesus says the same thing. Jesus actually says it's him, that he's the one who brings peace. Look at what Jesus says in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. So Jesus is recognizing the world gives a version of peace that's different from what he gives. He continues, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That there is a peace that he comes to bring that is nothing the world has to offer. Now, I know as I say that, there's some of you, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, and you have been searching for something. Maybe you haven't defined it as peace, but what's clear is that there's a part of your life, there's a hole in your heart that that yearns for something more. You, You desire to be filled, to be made whole. And what happens is we chase after different things, the things that we think will satisfy, the things that we think will make us whole, that will bring us life. And maybe we find something that does for a moment. We find something and it's good for a season, but something, whether that, that, that person leaves or that pursuit dissipates, once again, we find ourselves with a hole. We find ourselves longing for more. And if I could be so bold, what I would say to you is what you're pursuing has been the wrong thing. That what you're looking for is you're actually looking for Jesus because true peace can only be found in Jesus. Like the only way your life will ever be whole, 
The only way you will ever find peace is when you find Jesus. Because even when we have Jesus, when we have Jesus, even when life is gone off the rails, even when life isn't going as we planned, even when things seemingly are falling apart with Jesus, what we have is we have this supernatural work of his spirit that is moving in our lives, producing the fruit of peace in us that sustains us through every circumstance of life. And the Apostle Paul clearly understood this. He understood that peace didn't come from changing your circumstances, which is what we often think. Well, if I'm not at peace, I'll change my circumstances and I'll find peace. What he realized is that peace came from being connected to Jesus. Uh, matter of fact, in all 13 of Paul's letters, and he's got 13 books that he wrote in the New Testament, in all 13 of them, he uses this phrase, a phrase that might be familiar to some of you. He says, grace and peace be with you. On every letter he writes, grace and peace be with you. Grace and peace to you. It's almost as if what Paul is saying is that a person cannot experience peace, the second part of what he says, until they've embraced the grace of salvation that is found in Christ, in Christ alone. That if you want to experience peace, you have to experience God's grace. You have to realize that only in Jesus can your life be made whole. Now, I, I know as I say that, there, there's been some of you who have walked with Jesus your whole life. Or maybe you've walked with Jesus for a significant season of life, and I say that, and you're like, Mike, I don't experience peace. Like if you're saying all I need to do is follow Jesus and then I'm going to experience wholeness and peace. Well, I've done that. I, I, you know, I prayed the prayer. I got baptized. I come to church. I, got, I did that, but I don't experience peace. Why am I not experiencing peace? And the truth is I can't speak to your specific circumstances right here because I don't know it. Like, I don't know what is going on in your life. I don't know what the turmoil is in your life. I don't know where you're struggling to find peace in your life. But here's what I do know. That peace isn't found in a commitment that we made once. Peace is found in a commitment that we make daily to surrender our lives to Jesus. I, I, in all my years of ministry, I, I've come across people who struggle to find peace. And th these are some people that I have got a chance to walk with. A chance that I've got to hear some of their story. And if I had to say there was like sort of one unifying theme that played out in their life, it would be this that they never really surrendered their life to Jesus. Like they surrendered maybe their Sundays to Jesus. Like, Jesus, you have my Sunday. My Sunday, I go to church, check, got that off of my list, but then the rest of my life I'm in charge of. Or, or there's different aspects or parts of their life that they're willing to let go, willing to surrender, but everything else they're gonna hold on to. What I need us to understand is that peace is found in complete surrender. Uh, peace is found when you completely lay your life at the feet uh, of Jesus. And Jesus himself says this very thing. Like we don't have to guess that this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The call to radical surrender is exactly what Jesus tells us is what it looks like. Look at what he says in Matthew 16 and verse 24. He says this to his disciples. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now again, you've probably heard this verse before. Uh, you've read this verse before. Maybe you've even heard a pastor teach on this verse before. What I want us to understand, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about it, is I think we sort of sell short what Jesus is actually calling us to do. I mean, the first thing he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. It's this rec rec uh, recollection or recognition that it's not my life, but it's his. It's not my wants, it's not my desires, but it's the Lord's. That whatever he has marked out for my life takes precedent in my life. Like I have to let go of all of my pursuits, let go of all of my desires, let go of myself and follow after Jesus. And that idea is reinforced by what he says next. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must not just deny themselves, they must take up their cross and follow me. 
That concept of taking up our cross, we have sort of, sort of taken that and like, connected that with our burdens. Like what it means to follow Jesus is, yeah, we deny ourselves, but then we carry these burdens of life with us as we follow after Jesus. And so we carry with us the burden of a strained relationship. We carry with us the burden of a thankless job or a physical illness. We carry these things with us in life. And we even have put a phrase around it. And my guess is at some point in your life, some of you have said this phrase before. You said, well, this is my cross to bear. Like whatever it is, whatever ailment it is, whatever burden, whatever struggle, we'll say, well, this is my cross to bear. But that's not what Jesus means. Like he's not talking about you just carry your burdens in life as you follow him. What he's talking about with the cross is a direct connection to crucifixion. Now, a lot of you know this, but crucifixion was the most torturous way to die in the ancient world. It was the most painful way to die in the ancient world. It was a punishment that was reserved for people who rebelled against the empire, the Roman Empire. Like when you pushed back against authority, your punishment was crucifixion. And it would be played out visually for other people to see. And so this idea of taking up one's cross is not just something Jesus would have just said. People would have understood it because when this person is tried, when this person is sentenced to crucifixion, people in the town would gather. And you would see this convicted criminal carry their cross to the site of their ultimate death. It was this visual representation of complete and utter surrender. It was to illustrate that someone who rebelled against the empire would not be tolerated. This idea that the condemned person was so completely conquered that they would carry in their last act of life, they would carry the instrument of death to the place of their, of their death. And so this idea of carrying a cross in the context of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is this understanding of complete and utter submission. That we have surrendered all of our life to Jesus. That we are as committed to Jesus and and, and his lordship in our life as the condemned criminal was committed to his death. So therefore, this idea of self-denial, this idea of cross-bearing, what it is, is it's Jesus claiming authority over your life. And it's only when you give up authority, it's only when you willingly surrender everything to Jesus that you can step into and experience the fullness of life that he has marked out for you. But you have to surrender. If you want to experience peace, you have to surrender. Not just a part of you, not just the part that's easy for you, but you have to surrender every part of your life. That's exactly what Jesus is getting at. He continues in verse 25. He says, for whoever wants to save their life, Whoever wants to hold on to a part of their life, whoever is unwilling to surrender the fullness of their life, whoever wants to save their life will what? You guys can read. We'll lose it. You want to hold on to your life? You want to save your life? You will lose your life. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. That's what Jesus is getting at. I mean, that's some heavy stuff. Like, that's what it means to follow Jesus. Like, so you're sitting here, and you're not experiencing the peace that Jesus promises. My guess is because you're not following Jesus the way he calls you to follow him. Now, I, 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 I think one of the biggest reasons that we struggle as people to fully surrender our life to Jesus is worry. Like, we worry about a lot. And worry, of course, looks different for a lot of us. Like what worry looks like for one person might look completely different for someone else. But we worry, we worry about things like money. 
We worry about our job security. We worry about our relationships. We worry about our kids. We worry about our health. The list can go on. Our lives can get consumed with worry. And, and we, we have good excuses for it or good reasons. We think, okay, well, I mean, God's got a lot of people. Like seven and a half billion people. Like God's got a lot of people with a lot of worry. I don't want to burden him with my worry. I, I, I'm a lot more close to the worry than God is. And so I'll focus on what it is going on in my life. I'll worry about those things. And if it gets really, really bad, like if I get to the end of my rope, then I'll take it to God. But, but, but I'll, I'll take care of it. I'm going to worry about it. God doesn't need to worry about it at this point. Like we, we, we separate God from our worry. We push God out of the picture thinking that we can handle it and we can deal with it in our lives. And ultimately, that worry manifests itself in stress. Uh, a couple of years ago, the American Psychological Association conducted a survey. And what they wanted to find out is what percentage of Americans dealt with stress that manifested itself in physical health issues. Not just what percent of, percent of people had stress, because let me just, let me go ahead and make this clear. 100% of us have stress. We all have stress. It looks different. What we even call it is different. I think, guys, we, we don't like to say we worry a lot, so we'll say, like, I'm stressed out. I got a lot of stress going on right now. A lot of things are stressing me. We, 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 we call it stress when really it's just worry manifesting itself and stress, but the, and again, the APA wanted to figure out what percentage of Americans dealt with stress that manifested in health problems. And what they found is 76% of people in America have stress that leads to health complications. And one of the largest complications of health is anxiety. 35% of people, that pool of people, 35% of them said anxiety was the physical manifestation of the health issue in their life. And I get it. Like, I get it because I've been there. I get it because I've experienced it, and I've shared part of this before, but a few years ago, I found myself in, in, in a place where, like, randomly, like, my, my, my face would begin to go numb, and, like, my hands would start to tingle, and, like, my legs, my, like, lower legs, they'd start to, to, to lose feeling, and I thought, like, it's not a big deal. I can deal with it. I can handle it. Like, I, I definitely don't want to tell my wife because my, my wife's going to make me do something with it. But I can take care of it. I, I, I can handle this. Like, it'll go away. It's probably, I just, you know, bad pizza. Like, I shouldn't have had that for breakfast in the morning. Like, it, it, it will eventually solve itself. Ultimately, I ended up in the ER. And after a series of tests, the doctor was like, look, you're having a panic attack. And what a panic attack is, a panic attack is a cute spike of anxiety that plays out in your life. I, I can relate to this. I, I, I've experienced this exact thing. And let me tell you, that's the exact opposite of peace. And whether it's anxiety in your life or stress in your life or worry in your life, you know that if you allow any of those things to run rampant for too long, <laughs> it's the exact opposite of peace that you find in your life. But what if I told you, what if I told you there was something that you can do, something really simple that you can do that would help with all of this. Something that you could commit yourself to that would help reduce your anxiety, that would limit your stress, that would release some of your worry, that would put you in a place that you could ultimately experience peace. If I told you that there was something that you could do to get that, my guess is you'd want to know exactly what it is. And the truth is, there is something we can do. And the Apostle Paul makes that something completely clear. Look, look at what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I mean, it's right there. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, Whatever it is that you're anxious about, like whatever it is that is consuming you, worry about it more. He, he says, look, whatever it is, you just get yourself all worked up, get yourself all bent out of shape, because you know when you do that, it's going to solve the problem. Now, no, that's not what Paul says. It's what we do. Because we think, well, this is too easy. Like, there's no way, Paul. Like, you're saying when we're worrying, you're saying when we're stressed out, 
When you're saying when we have anxiety or some of these other issues that, that, that are the byproduct of stress, that all we're supposed to do is go to God in prayer? Like, is that really it? Like, are you saying the solution is prayer? And the truth is, yes, it is. Prayer is how we cultivate peace in our lives. Like, that's what you do. If you want to create and cultivate the soil for the Spirit of God to produce more peace in your life, then devote more of your life to prayer. If you want more peace in your life, have more prayer in your life. Some of the most prayerful people I've ever come across are the living embodiment of this verse. Like it seems like these people who devote their lives to prayer, it's like no matter what is happening in their life, like, oh, I, like I'm on the outside looking in and like, how are you so filled with peace in this moment? Like, if, like, I, like I would be falling apart. It feels like your life is falling apart, but there is just a peace and a perspective that you have. Where do you get that from? And I'll tell you, if you've encountered one of those people, they say, I pray. I pray all the time. Prayer is a priority in my life because I understand that prayer changes my life. If you want more peace, you need to devote your life to more prayer. Now, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an, a car guy. And so I'm about to give an illustration about an automobile. <laughs> and it might be a really bad illustration. But bear with me. And if I'm wrong, you can correct me afterwards. When I, when I first started driving, uh, my dad, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, look, here's the deal, son. If you want your car to run, you need two things. You need gas in the tank and oil in the engine. Your car will run forever if you do that. You keep filling gas in the tank. You keep making sure there's oil in the engine. And the truth is, your car will run without gas for a little bit. And the truth is, your engine will run without oil for a little bit, but eventually it will blow up. Eventually without oil, you will have catastrophic, complete failure in your engine. Without oil, everything is going to shut down. Everything is going to stop working, right? Okay, you tracking with me so far? If you drive an electric car, I don't know, create your own illustration. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. All right. So let's just, let's just make prayer oil. Let's just talk about how most of us live our lives. So we're running through life. There's not a lot of oil in life. Not a lot of oil we've added. And eventually things start to break down. And we can tell we're at a tipping point. And it's like right before we know when that catastrophic failure is going to happen, we think, ah, I got to add some oil. I got to pray. Like, I, I got I to gotta pray and then, and then God will take care of it. And here's what I want you to understand. When we turn to God, whenever we turn to God, he is grateful that we turn to him. And God does intercede on our behalf. God does help us address and work through what it is that we're going through. But he also understands that that's not how we were made to function. He knows that because he made us. That he knows that the way that we were uh, created was to be in constant relationship with him, to have a continual connection with him, that we don't just put oil in the car when everything's about to break down, but we're constantly filling the car with oil, creating the environment for the engine of life to run through every bump and pothole, to climb every hill, and to coast down every mountain that life brings our way. That when we become people who are devoted to prayer, people who've carved out time for prayer in our life, we are creating the greatest environment for God's spirit of peace to continually grow in us. And Paul completely understood this. Matter of fact, you might even know this, but when he writes the letter to the church in Philippi, he's writing that letter from prison. A, a place where very clearly no one would have like, no one would have uh, questioned him if he was dealing with anxiety. Uh, no, no one would have thought less of Paul if he was a bit overwhelmed. He's in prison. Yet in prison, he's writing this letter saying, do not be anxious. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition, submit your requests to God. Like, surrender your, 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 your issues, your life to God. And Paul has this perspective because he knows the result. Because he's experienced it firsthand. And he tells us exactly what that is in verse 7. He says, you do go to God. You do submit your requests to God. And when you do, he says, and the what? The peace of God. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Again, you know these people. Like when their life is in shambles and they're like, God's got this. Like there is a confidence in God because there is the depth of relationship that they have with God that has been cultivated in prayer. They're like, God's got this. Like that transcends all understanding. And the truth is, and what I want you to understand, is we can all be like those people if we do the same thing that those people do. Paul says the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will do what? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That when you become a person of prayer, God protects you. God God guards your heart. He guards your mind. He comes around you. And as he comes around you, you experience less anxiety. You experience less stress. You experience less worry. You find yourself more whole. And you find yourself living a life of peace. It's that simple. And I know sometimes we think, man, to be be a follower of Jesus, there's got to be more to it than this. To experience peace, there's got to be more to it than this. You've probably tried a lot of things to find peace in your life. I just invite you to try the thing that the Bible tells us is our pathway to peace. To become a person who's devoted themselves daily to prayer. To spending time with their Savior. And in that, unlocking the kind of life that their Savior wants them to live. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you so much for your patience with us. I know as people, and I speak for myself, it can be a struggle to surrender. It can be a struggle to let go. It can be a struggle to stop worrying. It can be a struggle to not get stressed out. I think all of this, God, is just the byproduct of me trying to hold what was never mine to begin with. So I pray that we be kind of the, the kind of people that are willing to let go, willing to trust in you, willing to believe that you care for us profoundly more than we could ever understand. That you want more for us than what we could even envision for ourselves. And so, God, I pray that it's on the basis of that trust that we have in you, that we do begin to surrender. We do begin to let go. We do pursue our relationship and our prayer life with you so that we might find life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I understand for a lot of people, uh, when it comes to prayer, even though it's like something we know we're supposed to do, um, it can be difficult to know where to start. Like, how, how do I... How do I start a prayer life or how do, I, how do I revive my prayer life? Like when it comes to prayer, like what do I even say? Like am I supposed to say the words of the Lord's Prayer? Like what does that look like? And so what I wanted to do as I wrapped up this morning is I wanted just to give you a simple prayer. Like if you don't know where to begin, if you don't know what to say, I want to give you a simple prayer that you can just pray day after day that I think will be a catalyst for your prayer life. And I'm going I'm to say it. It's going to be on the screen behind me. You can take a picture of it. Or if you don't get out your phones in time, you can scan that QR code and in the message notes, that prayer is in there. But this is what I want to invite you to pray. Dear Lord, teach me to trust in you so that when the unexpected storms of life come, which they will come, I will expect peace in the midst of the storm. Knowing that you are near, that you hear my cries, and you are with me and for me. 
God, no matter what life brings, that I might find peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. Because I know that my peace is not based on my circumstances. I know that my peace is based on you. And you are with me, and you are for me. And no matter what happens, I can get through it because I trust in that promise. That's a prayer. I'm going to encourage you to pray.